Okay, very good morning to you. Hope you're doing well. It is Wednesday, the 9th of September. Just before I begin, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. We've had lots of content coming the last few days. Uh, I did a breaking news one at around midnight London time last night. Uh, Eddie's done some videos about SoftBank and Tesla as well as our regular daily updates. So hopefully you're finding all of this uh, additional content useful. But going to start off then, uh, a quick recap of how we finished yesterday. And of course, it was another deep down day in the red and this followed then the Labor Day holiday, the extended weekend in the US so the first time that which they'd come back into the market and this is one of the things I was kind of inferring um, back on Monday when we did the first kind of look ahead for the week was that I wouldn't get too concerned about how we're going to perform X the US not being in and I'd rather not commit to say this is the bottom of the recent route or we're going to extend and correct lower until we see the US coming yesterday and and yesterday we definitely saw that continuation of the spillover in markets we've had initiated from really Thursday from last week. So again, the mega cap tech names were down. Um, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon ranging from around uh, three and a half to in Apple's case, 7%. Now, what does that look like from a, a percentage point of view? Well, actually from a technical definition, we are in a correction as far as the NASDAQ is concerned because we've obviously lost more than 10% since the initial highs that were seen just a few days ago. Um, yesterday the Nasdaq underperformed, so just as what we were seeing on the way up, Nasdaq outperforming, the flip reversed, the Nasdaq down over 5% yesterday, the S&P comparatively down just around 3%. Um, one of the other things that people were asking about, and Eddie put out an excellent video on the YouTube channel, so just go back onto his uh, distinct section on our channel and you'll be able to find that video of why their shares fell around 20% yesterday in New York trading. Uh, that was the most ever single day decline for their shares and it was on news of a partnership between competitors uh, Nicola Corp and General Motors but more from Eddie in that video uh, I strongly suggest you check that out if you're interested in Tesla stock um, otherwise elsewhere then following on from uh, generally that that negative close on Wall Street there was actually more negative news after market and I just so happened to be um, at my desk at the time, I was just doing a few emails and stuff, and then I saw the news break uh, about AstraZeneca, and it did create then uh, that information came while electronic trade was closed, but the reopening um, at 11 p.m. saw a gap down. You can see here in the S&P 500, uh, similar in the Nasdaq, and then we saw T notes gap up, uh, and the dollar actually strengthened at the time when the news came out, and it just pushed down cable to those fresh lows that were seen in the overnight session uh, which was around 129.50 in the futures at least so at the moment overall general sentiment still fairly fragile I would say but stock index futures have recovered after that initial knee-jerk response to the AstraZeneca news overnight which I'm going to recap and give you an overview in a second uh, the dollar's pretty steady the Dixie's flat but again, it does feel like the market's on tender hooks at the moment, waiting for the next um, kind of event to unfold. And there's been quite a string of some negative things that have occurred, obviously, uh, as of late. But in the FX markets, that means then that both currency pairs, major in the euro, dollar, and cable, are uh, down around 20 pips each, 25 respectively. Uh, in cable, uh, we can talk about a little bit more detail in a moment, but obviously since Boris Johnson's threat uh, to kind of walk away and leave the EU strong arming some of these talks going into the eighth round of negotiations that continue today. And we've also got the market bill coming out from the UK government, which is capturing a lot of UK headlines this morning. And all of that going to put further pressure, whether it's a bluff or not, on the success uh, of this deal. And undoubtedly, people need to start pricing in the potential risks of a, of a no deal. And uh, the pound having fallen now, the best part of around two and a half points uh, only literally this week, uh, but a, a complete reversal off from the uh, near test of 135 that we were seeing. Uh, and if you think about it, that was only eight days ago. Uh, so as we continue to see a little bit of downside pressure, 
Uh, we're at quite an interesting technical point um, as of this morning in, in cable, which would be around here, that previous resistance and support area that we saw back in toward the, uh, the latter part of July. Any breakdown of there, then key areas would be this 10th of June high. That was also an area of resistance before the break high on the 24th. And you've got the 200 DMA residing just below there uh, with the 128 handle. So a couple of things to keep an eye on there. And certainly we'll talk about the UK because there's been a meaningful government um, change as well in rhetoric uh, in regard to the amount of people that can gather uh, falling from 30 down to 6 in certain situations which I'll discuss in a moment. So that's the overall general sentiment. Crude oil as well still a little heavy uh, continuation of the decline that we've seen of late uh, with some apprehension both on the demand and the supply side. So uh, again I've got a couple of headlines I can discuss on that as well. So let's talk about Astra first. What exactly was this news from from overnight and what's happened here is AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine study put on hold due to suspect adverse reaction in a participant based in the UK. Uh, the nature of the adverse reaction and, and when it happened were not immediately known although the participant is expected to recover. Uh, the main parts of the article and this event that you need to be aware of are that the spokesperson describes the pause as a routine action which has happened whenever there's a potential unexplained illness in one of the trials. So um, one of the main things here, and, and perhaps one of the reasons why the market did recover overnight, is that uh, this is usual um, protocol as going through a clinical trial process, that if there is something like this that happens, well, then the strategic kind of move is to put everything on halt in order to not jeopardize the entire study uh, at in, in its entirety. Also as well other companies will have to halt their um, their current trial basis in order to then for them to see what exactly the deal was with this one-time uh, adverse reaction to then continue on as they were. So there's been a, a, a quite a negative reaction in markets initially overnight. It did look pretty heavy. Um, one thing I would say is that as far as the S&P is concerned there was a, I think it was the 21 DMA I was watching last night as the as the market came under some pressure. You can see this gap down, but you know we filled the gap and we're we're trading pretty flat to where we were at the close from yesterday. So we're still holding on to some of those losses. But on the daily continuation, if I just move my my camera for a moment, uh, you can see here I've marked up. It's the usual chart that we're used to seeing, um, but you had the excuse me not the 21 the 50 dma which is the red line briefly flirted with that at the initial uh, pressure that was seen the reopening of electronic trade on globex but we bounced off there and i do think that that's quite a key area uh, that i would be watching here in the s p which is around that 50 dma uh, and that previous high that we had on the 23rd of july before the renewed china tensions started picking up uh, that line comes in really around 3300 3284 would be the the peak on the on the 24th um, so around that kind of area i think is quite key but the 50 dma holding for the time being seeing quite a nice bounce uh, off around that area on the upside any recovery here though be looking out for a bit of resistance at around 55 50, 57 which was that previous uh, volatility low that we had uh, back at the end of last week but also it was an area of support to price during the, the kind of second and third week of August before the eventual push up to all time highs uh, and then we saw this rotation out of some of the tech names so yeah quite a key, key, key band here on the low on the downside between the 50 DMA uh, and then also on the upside now that previous support term resistance seen up around 55, 57 uh, in the spoos. Um, a few other details then about this Astra story then, just to go over and give you a bit more context and, and how I would look at this. Um, there are currently nine vaccine candidates in phase three trials. AstraZeneca is the first phase three COVID-19 vaccine trial known to be put on hold at the moment. But I don't think, as I just described, it would be too unusual to see the others taking a momentary hiatus just until we get some sort of definitive conclusion what exactly was the reasoning and the details behind why Astra uh, has got to this point and putting their study on hold. Um, Astra only began its phase three trial in the US in late August. Um, one thing to be aware of is I did tweet um, yesterday, uh, this was quite a, a good 
and detailed kind of release from Stat News, who uh, was the website that broke this exclusive article last night. They've been particularly timely with their information. But they actually have a section, if you just navigate around their site, where you can look at all of the different, basically, every single treatment and vaccine with uh, direct links to the, uh, the studies, the details, with notes and updates, which tell you by date what exactly is happening. So here you can see University of Oxford and AstraZeneca is the one we were discussing last night. Moderna Therapeutics and BioNTech and Pfizer are the three big ones that people are tracking, and this is a good way of keeping on top of those. In terms of actual reaction, um, one of the things is that I was looking at the AstraZeneca ADRs, so the kind of after hours uh, US kind of traded shares of Astra, and they were down around 8.1% when they closed. So indications are for the open on the FTSE, it could be quite messy for Astra at the open. Uh, losses to the tune of 8 to 9% are expected for this morning. And you know, AstraZeneca is a uh, particularly large component of the FTSE 100, so definitely be keeping an eye on that. Those related companies in the pharma space, well actually, uh, Moderna shares were up about 4.25%, and BioNTech ADRs were up around 3%. So such is life in the way that shares respond. Um, you know, the, the other companies take benefit from the, from the fact that AstraZeneca have, had, have hit a bit of a speed bump here in these latest uh, phase three trials. Um, another thing, a comment that I saw overnight um, was from Anthony Fauci, who's that um, ex medical expert in the US, and he said that Moderna and Pfizer by Entech COVID vaccine trials are expected to be enrolled by the end of September and allow another one to one and a half months for a second dose, while added it is unlikely that they'll have any form of definitive answer by November 3rd. Now Fauci's been a bit of a pain for Trump. Remember Trump on Labor Day was giving his speech quite anti-China and he was also talking about the fact that they'll have a vaccine by October and Fauci's coming out now saying that they won't have a definitive answer by November 3rd, which is obviously the election. Uh, that's not unusual. Fauci's been much more, I'd say, realistic. And we know that Trump generally is politically just posturing in terms of making these kind of quite brash promises without any really scientific proof. And, uh, and that would be particularly fast to get it through by the timelines that he's suggesting. Um, but... One of the main things here is that a setback like this, you know, what's quite intrinsic for the success of Donald Trump coming into this election is that he would want a vaccine coming fast. That's just going to help then offset any negativity that might have built up around his handling uh, of the COVID situation, obviously in the US being one of the hardest hit. So as much as he can frame kind of China as the main narrative and law and order with some of the social unrest in America, he definitely needs a vaccine as well. And this AstraZeneca news, be interested to see what he has to say about this when he uh, gets up and starts tweeting later on today. Um, a few other things I wanted to mention, uh, and that was there was some other news that broke last night at pretty much 10 minutes around the same time that the information about Astra broke. And that was about the number of infections per day in the UK. And that explains why the government uh, has come out and made their latest move last night. Now, the number of infections of confirmed coronavirus cases in the UK has shot up quite sharply since the weekend. We've been tracking new cases of around 3,000 uh, per day. And we were, down at the beginning of August, it was sub 1,000. So it's tripled, basically, uh, since where we were. We were, we were sub 1,000 for the best period of about one and a half months. Uh, so this is quite a breakout and puts confirmed case levels at levels we have not really seen since some of the peak numbers going back to May or even April. And if you remember in the UK, April was when we were in the most severe period of the national lockdown. Uh, this, of course, all comes as um, the economy starts to attempt to reopen. Um, I was actually off the desk yesterday afternoon and I and I had some time and I managed to have a little walk around Borough Market uh, in central London. And it was by far the busiest I've seen it since going all the way back to the lockdown happening in March. It was almost felt like normal service had resumed apart from tourists. Um, certainly all the restaurants were full, you know, bars were busy, uh, so on and so forth. So 
quite interested to see now, uh, and particularly with the test of time, people's tolerance and patience for adhering to a lot of these rules like social distancing and whether that can be maintained is going to be key. And of course, we're coming into a very important seasonal period of the year when naturally with the cold weather, that forces people indoors and that can heighten the increased transmission of the virus. And this all coming with the government looking to push people back into work to get the economy going kids back to school so all of these things could be the perfect cocktail to seeing this number um, escalate quite quickly and hence the reason why i feel then that the government has had no other choice but to start making some of these changes uh, that they've announced last night because for them the worst case would be the localized lockdowns turn into national lockdowns and that economically would be incredibly damaging for the prospects of the shape and speed of the UK recovery. Um, one of the things that people have looked at with this um, is that um, one concern for ministers is the rules are being flouted, in particular by young people, um, who may not be the greatest risks or at risk of contracting the virus or indeed dying from it in, in regards to what we've seen from the data, but it's more questioned about who do they pass the coronavirus onto and their potential more vulnerable relations, i.e. older demographic. So one of the things here, confirmed cases in England now among younger people, the dark blue bar would be indicative of previous weeks. The, the light pale blue bar is the latest week. And as you can see here, we've had a really high pop between the ages of 10 to 20 and 20 to 30, whereas it's quite the flip side on the older uh, demographic going all the way from 60 up to 80 plus is the, the, the exact opposite. Um, so what has this led to? Well, Boris Johnson came out last night then, uh, and again, it is a bit of a U-turn. As I said, the, the government, uh, Dominic Rabb for one, was very forceful over weekend and Sunday media in the UK in order to try to push people back into work as a key component in getting the co economy firing again. Uh, but this does cause more complications then because this would somewhat be the opposite of that. Uh, and what's happened is that all social gatherings now of more than six people will be banned in England under new limits to be announced by UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson on Wednesday uh, as coronavirus cases grow. Also, uh, the front page of kind of the Telegraph this morning, uh, they were talking about that some of the uh, quite stringent lockdowns that have been happening in areas I think it was like um, Bolton uh, and also Blackburn, these areas in the north in the UK at the moment who've seen uh, quite extreme community type outbreaks which are more persistent and long lasting in terms of how many people they're affecting. Uh, they're implementing curfews, meaning again like we've seen on Australia with the outbreak in Melbourne which got particularly out of control that they too adopted a curfew where people were not allowed to basically leave and be out active in the night time between the periods of generally um, 10 p.m. And, and 5 a.m. But interested to see that that's been uh, talked about as potentially being adopted on a nationwide level should this situation continue to get out of control. So, yeah, some interesting stuff happening here. All of this obviously is going to test the political favorability of the government. Um, yes, you could argue that they've got to take decisive action in order to control what is uh, likely to be a very challenging time to suppress the further increase of these cases going into the winter period. Um, however, it does fly somewhat in contrast from some of the recent government communication and this all coming in the backdrop, of course, of ongoing Brexit talks. Uh, and on that front, um, Wednesday is one of the busiest days for this. It, I mean, this is looking at the agenda. They're talking about all the major things again, level playing field, horizontal arrangements, governance, fisheries, trading goods, so on and so forth. Um, one of the main things we've had come out this morning though is this, which is the UK government admits it will break international law over Brexit treaty. Uh, what this is talking about then is it quoted um, basically Jonathan Jones, the head of the government's legal department has quit the protest that plans to withdraw the Brexit withdrawal agreement. Uh, Brandon Lewis has said that, uh, that this does break international law in a specific and limited way of plans to override the Brexit withdrawal agreement. It's a little bit technical in terms of its legality, but basically the, co the government's kind of disagreeing what the government agreed, which then got it elected uh, back in the election. So it's a little bit, again, um, 
interesting to see how this is going to play out. Essentially, what it would appear to be on the surface is that the UK government's trying to play a game of kind of brinksmanship to try and force Europe to the table, talking about them um, trying to talk about, look, we're going to release our internal market bill today about how all of the uh, countries within um, United Kingdom are going to operate with each other. We'll start accelerating our preparation of what life looks like outside of um, then the EU beyond the transition period at the end of the year with particular then uh, emphasis on the Northern Ireland situation which remains as it always has been a, a real sticking point and contentious issue uh, and this would be uh, one of the main critical points of this matter. Uh, senior UK Sky sources, Sky News sources uh, believe the UK Chief Negotiator Frost will conclude that a deal with the EU is not achievable without fundamentally compromising the UK red line. So at this point, I don't want to dramatise this too much because all the way from the beginning of the week, we did not anticipate that there would be any type of real movement on either side at the conclusion of the eighth round of negotiations this week, and it's looking very much to be the case. But look, just just jumping back onto the pound, this is one of the main things that I'm anticipating. Fundamentally, at the moment, you've got a risk-off atmosphere that's helping support the greenback. Uh, the dollar index continues to bounce from its very depressed levels we've had over recent weeks. The Dixie starting to liven up now again. It took a bit of a pop on the Astro News last night. Some of the uh, negative uh, end of Wall Street yesterday. Now we've got uh, this latest fundamental a renewed risk for the pound. Not only is the Brexit side getting more evidently clear that they continue to remain very far apart and UK governments being very stern with their stance, but now there's risks of a, a new kind of outbreak in coronavirus and that's going to impede then the government's ability to reopen the economy as per perhaps previously envisaged. And that's only going to have negative economic consequence. So here you can see cable. Just getting a little extension here, 20 pip pop or so on the break of the overnight low, that was the Astra low, and the range low of Asia just giving way with some of this Dixie strength. So yeah, if we break around these key levels, it does open up the uh, potential for a bit of a deeper run here uh, in sterling. So 100% fundamentally, just given the setup, worth keeping an eye on for some potential for more downside pressure as we go through the day. Um, Oil is the final thing I wanted to mention. Um, it trades uh, well below 40, now trading a 36 handle. Um, we've, we've had a, a level just being marked out as quite key support here in the near term that's definitely worth keeping on. 36.13 in the futures. Uh, this would be the afternoon low from yesterday. This would be the post Astra low. Uh, it also got a bit of a hit, just general risk off that was observed when that news article hit. And so definitely worth keeping an eye there. Uh, as we push through the session. Generally what people are talking about in the oil market is crude continues to be hurt uh, in a combination of uh, supply and demand dynamics. Uh, we've had a little bit of renewed tension of US-China relations after what had been a fairly quiet previous week. Um, we've had a further ongoing retreat in stocks which is just denting a little bit of general risk appetite and sentiment. Uh, and then also uh, we've had this latest news about the COVID-19 vaccine being potentially delayed, which again is going to impede perhaps where expectations were in regards to how quickly uh, the recovery could take, take place globally and therefore uh, the type of look of what demand looks like in the future. Um, the coronavirus pandemic is still raging and Bank of America Merrill Lynch analysts have said that it will take three years for oil demand to fully recover from the outbreak, even if there is a vaccine. Uh, the other thing that this Bloomberg article is, is mentioning that's worth noting is that market structures point to more downside risks for oil prices. Contangos, where um, near-term prices are cheaper than longer-dated contracts, are widening for both global and US benchmarks, pointing to increasing concern uh, of oversupply. Uh, Abu Dhabi as well has followed suit of Saudi Arabia, and they've cut their official crude pricing for October, uh, and all of these things as well have acted as quite bearish signals so far this week for oil prices uh, as well. So yeah, keeping an eye on that price point and that product, uh, as I mentioned, around 36.13 in the futures. As far as the, the day is concerned on the calendar, uh, it is relatively quiet. Uh, let me just quickly 
jump back on the headlines and give you the latest with the Chinese inflation data. The CPI year on year was in line, 2.4%. The PPI uh, minus 2% in line as well. So no great movements on the back of that. People looking more on, on a lot of these headline stories I've been talking about. Uh, so no reaction to the Chinese data, both in line in terms of those inflation metrics. For the European morning, it is very quiet. And typically what you tend to see then is people get drawn to some of these major um, headlines in play perhaps then reacting to them more so than they normally would because of the fact that the calendar is particularly light. So do bear that in mind. Uh, Astra at the open is going to be quite a key one to watch. And again, as I said, pre-market indications, it could be indicative then that they could open down as much as 8 to 9%. Um, otherwise, in the afternoon, no major 130s out of the US. The Bank of Canada rate decision, they're expected to keep rates on hold. Uh, and then as far as fixed income is concerned, you've got $35 billion in a 10-year note auction coming later as well. All right, that is it. I can let you guys get on with your day. So thanks as ever for listening. Uh, please do remember to subscribe to the channel if you're new to Amplify Trading. Uh, and feel free to drop me any questions in the comments section. Always happy to help. Okay, guys, have a great day ahead.